Welcome, everybody. I'm Rick Ackermans. I'm the Wrist Activity Group uh, Chair. And uh, my day job and my night job and my weekend job uh, is Director of RF Transmissions for uh, CBS. Today's presentation on RIT is RIST. What is the future? So well, portions of this presentation were written by Sarah Narana from Cobalt Digital and Adi Rosenberg from VideoFlow. So our RIST topics are the history of RIST. Why does RIST keep evolving? Overview of current RIST simple and main profile. What is under development in the new RIST advanced profile? And how can I use RIST? And current and future RIST implementation examples. Will RIST be able to help with C-band satellite, uh, C -band satellite spectrum shortage? And can I do network distribution with RIST? So we'll start with the history of RIST. Who are the players involved in RIST? Well, we have the Video Services Forum, which created the RIST Activity Group a number of years ago. By the way, I didn't create this slide, but I just you know, happened to notice that the person sitting at the head of the table was a redhead, so I assumed it must be me. It just, you know, I figured it worked out. Anyway, I digress. So, <laughs> okay. so we have the RIST specifications, uh, which we'll get into in a moment. This, these are created by the RIST Activity Group of the Video Services Forum. Now, the Video Services Forum then decided that they needed another entity to distribute information on RIST and, and market it and be a user group. So outside of that, we created a marketing entity called the RIST Forum. Now, all the companies in the RIST Activity Group are also members of the RIST Forum. So if anybody is not familiar with this, you have the Video Services Forum, which is the keeper of RIST and is responsible for all of the technical content in the RIST documents and is solely responsible for the RIST documents. The marketing activities of, for RIST uh, is done by the RIST Forum. The RIST Forum, however, does not have any technical input other than you know, being able to make a suggestion as to what is actually in the RIST document. So the RIST document itself and the technology is, is solely, solely under the auspices of the Video Services Forum. Hey Rick, I noticed they got the uh, hair color of of me on that table wrong. I, it, it's a, the bald guy is uh, yeah should have blondish hair, not not that dark stuff. But uh, we'll fix that in uh, in post. We'll fix that in the next rev. Yes, we will. <laughs> so here's the the risk timeline. So back in February of 2017, the risk activity group was created within the video services forum. The first draft of the simple profile came out in April of 2018. And we did our first interop in May of 2018. Then the second draft of the simple profile was created in July of 2018. We did another interop of that for the public in September of 2018. And then we finally published the simple, the original version of the simple profile in October of 2018. It was at that point that it was decided that some additional uh, marketing and distribution was necessary and the RIST Forum was created, which is a separate entity from the Video Services Forum, as I mentioned, which is who is sponsoring this presentation. Commercial products first became available in April of 2019, so about a year and a half after the whole project started. And then, well, I'm sorry, two, two years after the whole project started, sorry. Basic math always throws me off. Uh, then the main profile of, of the of the the draft was done in uh, September of 2019. And then the main profile, which is the full second version, uh, was published uh, in March of 2020. So the question is, why does RIST keep evolving? Originally, when we came up with TR-06-1, it was the first uh, of the simple profile. Then we came up with TR06-2, and that was published on March 10th of 2020. So it was the original profile was October 17th, 2018, March 10th, 2020. There were a few minor modifications that we decided that needed to be made to TR06-1, and I'll get to what those are in a, in a few moments. 
So we published a revised version of TRO 6 1 on June 25th of 2020. So just a, uh, just a little over a month ago. Coming up in the very near future, we are coming up with a, um, the, what we call the main profile interoperability levels. This is a, a, a appendix, so to speak, to the TRO 6 2. It is not a replacement. It is just interoperability levels and certain uh, guidelines to help people use TRO 6 2. Um, this should be coming out very shortly, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. And then we have currently the video service forum TRO 6 3 under development. Now, as I said, why are we modifying these things? Some people have said, why can't you just publish a standard and be done with it? Well, because RIST, like many things, is software. And as I'm sure everybody notices, whether you're dealing with your iOS on your iPhone or you're dealing with Windows, software keeps evolving. People, while they would be willing to buy a box and say, this box does this, you know, certain things and I'll just keep using it the same way, in the software-defined world, we want updates. We want it to be current. We don't want to have another product that, that, super, that is much better than it. And stuff doesn't stay still. Computers don't stay still. The internet doesn't stay still. Compression doesn't stay still. So we're, we're living in a rapid pace, software-driven world. And the only way for the VSF to keep up with it is to keep wrist current. Um, so while we have had some people say, why can't you just leave it the way it is? If you wanna live in a software world, you're, you're gonna have to deal with updates. You know, for those of you sitting there with your PCs, Microsoft issues an update every week. And if there's a software issue, I mean, a, a, a security issue, even quicker than that. I've lost track of what dot, dot, dot version of iOS I'm running on. Um, so compared to many other software applications, our updates don't come all that quickly. But in order to keep it topical and to keep it current, uh, we will unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, uh, need to be updating uh, RIST to keep it topical. So what did we do with, uh, with uh, TRO 6-1? Well, the original came out on October 17, 2018. About a month ago, on June 25th, 2020, we issued an update. The only difference between the original 2018 version and, uh, of the simple profile and the current document is the addition of an optional round trip time echo message. Uh, the document is in section 5.2.6 and some changes in language to be more accurate about the normative and informative provisions of this document. The purpose of this optional message is to provide a mechanism whereby risk receivers can measure the round trip time between itself and the risk sender. This information may be used uh, by, by the risk receiver to optimize the NAC request as uh, network conditions change. This is something that we felt was necessary to keep uh, risk functioning. And we made certain that we are backwards compatible and it is a you know, relatively minor change. Uh, if this were an iOS version, it would be a dot update. Um, but with the way we work, we, 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 have an, we have to update the document. So that's what we did to TRO 6-1. Overview of RISC technology. So currently we have the two existing profiles, the simple profile and the main profile, which are available. The advanced profile, we expect to be released uh, at VidTrans 2021. So let's look at the simple profile. It consists of a base stream and standard RTP compatible with non-RISC devices without protection. Other features include packet recovery using ARQ, high performance, uh, it's shown that it can demonstrate that it can deal with up to 50% packet loss. And that's very important. When you're dealing with the internet, um, packet loss can be a problem. Uh, so if you don't want to take hits and you want your video to maintain uh, quality, you have to have good packet loss uh, protection. And RIST is about the highest in the industry right now. It supports multi-link support, where you can bond and spread over multiple links to achieve higher throughput. Seamless switching sends multiple copies of the stream, so one link goes down, the stream stays up without glitching. 
I'll have a little example of that later on. And companies are free to innovate and improve their products without losing compatibility. Domain profile. Multiple streams can be combined into one single UDP port. This simplifies IT configuration because only one port is open uh, without having to open many, many ports for the various parts of the stream, uh, which could be very difficult in dealing with IT departments, firewalls. Um, that could be the difference between getting working functional video and not. The connection can be, in, can be integrated at either endpoint. That's a change from the simple profile. Where you had to have an op where you had to have your receive point open, uh, as it is with the main profile. If you can get through either from sender to receive or receiver to sender, you can initiate initiate your stream. So, for example, if you are at like the re the receive point, you could make certain that your receivers are accessible from the outside and your firewall ports are open enough for accessibility. The sender side can just go can just go out through a firewall without having to worry about that. Uh, optional support for any type of uh, band IP data. Risk connection can be used to manage remote devices and technicians at headquarters can, can quote, ride the risk connection back to the field and manage uh, adjustments in the field. That's important if you have a situation where your operator in the field is not necessarily an engineer, but is just a user. It allows an engineer or somebody more knowledgeable about risk uh, back at the station or the network or wherever your receive point is to control and configure the equipment there. The main profile has encryption, unlike the simple profile. This main profile offers configurable top of the line AES encryption. RIST uses DTLS encryption, a similar encryption stack that is used for many internet applications. With encryption, it's important to use something that is solid and has been vetted by the industry. You don't want to have to uh, invent the wheel. RIST has a pre-shared key mode uh, for one to, to many situations, uh, also, also useful for future satellite scenarios. Authentication guarantees that whoever is connecting to your endpoint through the internet is who you think they are. You, you don't, you, uh, authentication guarantees that when you connect to some place in the internet, it's the place you think it is. We, you know, we don't want, the last thing we want to have is a situation where we're on air with a live feed and we suddenly find ourselves getting Zoom bombed by who knows who, uh, that would not be a good thing. So, you know, RIST uses the same techniques used to guarantee that when you connect to a bank, you are actually connecting to your bank. Uh, certificates of authentication on both client and server, password-based authentication for simpler cases. Other features include support for bandwidth optimization using null packet deletion, uh, you can transparently reclaim 5% of your stream bandwidth. Uh, if you're in a tight situation, if you're using like, you know, LTE or something, you need every bit you can get. Um, so the last thing you want to do is use up your bits by sending null packets. Support for high bit rate operations, possibly even including uncompressed or lightly compressed streams. Within the profile of RIST, there is no high end limit. So if you have a pipe big enough and hardware fast enough, if you need to, if you want to send 1.5 gig uncompressed over the internet, if your wrist device has enough uh, through processing power, and if your bandwidth pipe is, is, is there, there is no reason you can't. Um, theoretically, you could send 12, 12 gig uncompressed 4K. Uh, once again, you'd have to have fast enough processing on either side. You have to have a big enough internet pipe or pipes if you're, uh, if you're segmenting your signal. Um, but there is nothing in the, in the code of risk that prohibits you from doing that. Now the advanced pro profile. Now this is a future release. This is all currently under development. Um, some things are subject to change. So the advanced profile, and I will read the disclaimer again, it's under development. So people don't come back and say a year from now, you said it will include auto configuration or plug and play. So you will be able to connect up and let it do the negotiations and, and configure your signal. Uh, currently, you do have to know a lot of the parameters uh, in order to make it work. This makes it a lot easier for people in the field who are, are shooters 
and may be far more knowledgeable in, uh, in, in focusing and framing a shot than they are in the technology of transmissions. Dynamic reconfiguration. As your situation changes, as your data rates change, as the internet changes, it will automatically be able to adjust to that in real time. It's all part of the auto configuration. Congestion control. Once again, it is the internet. You know, I wish we could say that, oh, I have uh, 100 megabits and it'll always be 100 megabits and it will never change. Um, fortunately, the internet is the, if you will, the wild west of transport. And you will run into congestion and you will need to be able to have protocols that will allow you to deal with it. Uh, part of this includes sending feedback uh, to, to an encoder. While we do not define the encoder, we will be giving information to the encoder saying that there is a congestion situation and it can decide what it needs to do in order to reduce bandwidth. VBR support, uh, the ability to uh, deal once again with dynamic ranges based on the, the content you're involved with and uh, be able to deal with it so you're not using bandwidth you don't need when you don't need it. Internet satellite hybrid model, I will get to that in a little bit. Um, but we have issues going on right now with C-band spectrum space, especially in the U.S., and we are looking at RIST as a uh, potential solution uh, for that in several different ways. Common management API and MIBs are under, under development. Time and control based on a, time, on a common clock. Uh, if you had multiple RIST paths, the, what we're working on is the ability to have a well-defined output time so that if you had multiple streams coming via multiple paths, you would have the tools necessary to zero time them. So if you had camera A and camera B coming via different paths, you could have them in time. VPN support, once again, very important with security, important with firewalls. Um, we are working on being able to fully implement VPNs uh, for, so that you have a, com a single common flow um, as well as dealing with security issues. And then RIST Tunnel ARQ. Uh, what we are looking to do is what can we do with the RIST Tunnel to make it more efficient, to make sure that ancillary data makes it through. Um, we are also looking into using uh, payload compression for the ancillary data, differentiating that from video compression of the video. But if you're going to be using RIST for ancillary data, be it large quantities of data, be it um, PTZ information, be it CCU information, um, dealing with a format of data compression uh, to improve the efficiency. And we are also working on IGMP uh, listening. Oh, and rendezvous point automated firewall transversal. That also gets back into the VPN and other things, uh, but how you get through your firewall is you know, a, a major issue. In the corporate world, many ports need to be opened up. So we are looking at methodologies for helping to get through firewalls. We're also looking at having cloud-based uh, access points where both, where both the transmitter and the receiver effectively could generate an outgoing connection, which automatically opens up the firewall and being able to meet at a cloud, at a cloud providing point. Similar to we are, what we're all doing right now as we are all here on, on Zoom, where obviously we're not, we're not connecting peer-to-peer, -peer, we are connecting through a cloud-based server. All the standards in parts in the main and simple profile are based on R R RFCs and other open standards used in RIST, and we are planning on doing that in the advanced profile as we develop, as we move along with it. So that is the, the simple overview of the simple profile, the main profile, and what we are conceptually doing uh, in the advanced profile. So what can RISC do for me? Well, for one thing, unfortunately, we've all had to learn how to work remotely. Um, that's what we've all pretty much been doing for the better part of the last four months. So content providers are demanding the ability for remote production and content workflows. Uh, there's a need to implement secure, low latency solutions over the public internet. And COVID-19 has pushed remote for workflows forward. Uh, they have pushed it, pushed it forward at a rate we weren't even thinking of, but that 
wor remote workflows have become the norm. And I can say that we've all sort of agreed that to some extent, uh, having to work remotely or working remotely is here to stay. Uh, there are certain efficiencies in remote workflow for, in, in, for many people. And I think that even after the COVID situation has hopefully subsided in the not all that distant future, uh, working from home, working remotely is, is going to be around. Uh, it, it has efficiencies, it has cost benefits, and uh, we need to continue on uh, figuring out ways to do that far, far more effectively. Cloud infrastructure. Many workflows are migrating to public cloud infrastructure and services, including uh, AWS and others. Video needs to be moved around the cloud uh, for editing, transcoding, over the top and play out. Trade-offs between upfront, upfront costs, and cloud storage and bandwidth uh, against an on per diem cost, on-premises on cost. And uh, can our existing services and equipment migrate or integrate with the cloud and with cloud services? Uh, RIST is helping quite a bit with that. You know, we, a, there is RIST in the cloud, and um, there's a lot of stuff going on with it, which I will also get to more later. So what are the problems? I want to use the internet as a cost-effective mean of transporting high-quality broadcast-grade video. But delivery through the internet is not guaranteed, and video may glitch. I need to be able to use a link or combination of links anywhere to move my content. Many solutions add a lot of latency. I would go so far as to say most solutions add a lot of latency. Um, you know, that's why you know, you're, not, you're not gonna be using YouTube Live for live interviews. I, I need my content to be protected so it doesn't get stolen. And bad people must not be able to hijack my feed. As I said earlier, we don't wanna be Zoom bound. And my IT people are very busy and I need a straightforward approach for them to set up. Every time I want to bring in a feed, I don't want to have to have them going in and reconfiguring the firewall. Now, other people have solutions like this. And there are many, many good solutions out there. The problem is most of the proprietary solutions are just that. They're proprietary. They don't interoperate. So why is RISC different? Well, RISC is a joint effort between many of the leading companies that provide video delivery over the internet. Experts with hundreds of man years of experience freely contributed to this effort. Best of class technologies in every aspect of the pro of, of protocols while following established standards whenever possible. The final result is you have a choice to pick the best equipment for your speci specified application. You're not locked into a single ecosystem from one provider. And that's the main thing that RISC provides is that you can, you can pick and choose the right uh, equipment manufacturer. RISC products. If you want to buy RISC products, you can find uh, many of the police products from, from multiple vendors, encoders with built-in RISC, decoders with built-in RISC, uh, RISC gateways, conversion between RISC and other protocols, system integrators with RISC experience, and RISC services in the cloud. There is open source RISC. Uh, we have Liberist, FFmpeg, Wireshark. All of these have uh, readily available open source plugins that are available. RISC features include Diverse data path sharing. Now, as I mentioned earlier, what we can do is you can take, and if you need more bandwidth than is available, you have a source. Let's say you have a 4G, 5G here, and you have, say, a cable stream. It can be any source here. You can break your data down and send a, 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 a disproportionate amount of your data through the two paths. So you can be asymmetric uh, to maximize uh, the amount of throughput. And it's not just two. You can have multiple, depending on the, the physical hardware, you can have two, three, four, um, or more connection paths. So you can bond paths together in order to get the necessary throughput if you do not have a single uh, source available with the throughput you need. It has seamless switching. The internet goes down. Things go wrong. It happens. If somebody says, I need an internet connection pipe that's never going to go down, sorry, it doesn't exist. But by due to the, the, the way RIST works, where we send a packet and then it acknowledges that packet and sends it again, you can configure it that if it doesn't, that if you send your packet through path A, if the, if the packet doesn't arrive, it can request the packet be sent either through path A, path B, or path A and B. 
So if you're operating like this and you actually lose one of your two paths, if the paths are capable of supporting the data throughput uh, with, the, with the main profile, uh, you won't even see a glitch or a hit. We are working in the advanced profile that if your transmitter side has to throttle back because you've gone from a big pipe to a smaller pipe, that it will be able to quickly or hopefully even seamlessly throttle back if you lose one of, one of your two or more legs. It also has full bi-directional support. It's not just one way for re return of any kind of data you may need via the return path. A good example of that would be if you've got a, a PTZ camera here, uh, the PTZ camera, the control and the CCU can, can come back via the return path. So you can remotely use using the risk transport control and CCU your PTZ camera. Uh, just as a footnote, we do have several vendors who are working on uh, trying to incorporate uh, RIST into uh, PTZ cameras. At the moment, if you want a PTZ camera, you have to purchase a PTZ camera, possibly one with an SDI output, but, but then you can go into your RIST encoder. There are multiple vendors that do have remote PTZ cameras. The data flow for the PTZ and the CCU can currently come back through RIST. This is readily available within, within the uh, main profile today. I talked earlier about dropout, and here's actually one that they found during testing. This was a test risk test going on. It was actually using a, a cable modem um, to uh, bring, bring the signal back. And they found that during the testing, they actually had an 80, briefly had 86% burst loss. Uh, that can happen because you know cable modems are TDM, so you're sharing time with other people and other uh, users coming off your node. Uh, they're a lot more bursty and a lot more dropouts than you have, say, usually on fiber internet. But in this particular case, even though there was an 86% loss of data for a given interval of time, the unrecovered loss was zero. RIST was able to fully fill in the gap because the uh, loss of data did not exceed the buffer window. I mentioned RIST in the cloud. How would you use RIST in the cloud? So here's an example. As you would normally have today, you have your remote site. Yeah, I actually took this from another presentation. I know this is an old black and white CBS camera, but I like the camera, so I figured I'd use it here. We've upgraded it to do uh, 4K HDR, maybe. What would you, you do, keep the metal work? Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah, actually even the lenses wouldn't support it, but oh well. Uh, the, uh, so we have our traditional wrist. You go into your compression, you go into your wrist, and you go to your receive, reception site. Okay, that's fine, but we don't have to do it that way. And there's re advantages in not doing it that way. We can go through a data center. And you can take your data and put using software actually at the data center. You can do a risk transmission to the site, but you don't have to stop there. You can go to multiple sites. The software at the data center is perfect. While, while the risk stream is a unicast stream, Within a data center, you're perfectly capable of generating multiple unicast streams uh, that can go to multiple sites. So there's no limit to you know, the number of sites you could, you could go to. But what happens if the data center goes down? Well, you don't, only have, you don't have to go through just one data center. You can have two streams going from your risk device to diverse data centers, and then from those data centers going to multiple paths going into your risk receiver. This gives you a very high level of reliability, the type necessary for, for like network distribution. And uh, you can have a loss of a data center. And if you architect it carefully and you're using say diverse internet service providers, starting every step of the way, you went with internet service provider one to data center one and use the different internet service provider to go to data center two making certain you have inter diverse internet providers to your destinations, that gives you an extremely high level of reliability uh, for keeping critical 24 seven content on the air via wrist. And this can all be done today. The pieces are all there within the main profile to do this today. So this is not even in the advanced profile. This is stuff that is doable within the main profile.
And as I said, you're not limited to just two. Theoretically, you could connect to thousands of endpoints. Um, so very large scale distribution via risk in the cloud. Other practical uses of the cloud, and these are actually real uses that are, in, that are being done today. Um, I haven't put the names there, but these are actual implementations uh, of using news uh, and distributing via a cloud-based provider to, to multiple stations, multiple news content distribution being done today uh, via, via wrist in the cloud. Multicast uh, distribution using Liberist, which is one of our open source uh, wrist implementations. AWS and some others, um, Media Connect today uh, already are using uh, support wrist. So it is, it is used by cloud service providers. Now we did a cloud, uh, cloud risk demo. We did this back at VidTrans in February, uh, just before the world stopped turning. We had multiple server, multiple clients sending information back to a server in Florida. And from there, a combined signal was sent, a uh, multi-viewer was created and sent to the show floor at uh, VidTrans in Marina Del Rey. And this is, this is a outline of what we had. And we actually posted that on YouTube. The link is down here on the bottom. Wes sent the link out. You can watch it yourself. Risk satellite hybrid. This is what is being developed as part of the uh, advanced profile. One of the reasons for this is here in the US, the Federal Communications Commission has decided to take the majority of the C-band spectrum away from satellite. Uh, not the smartest move in my personal individual opinion, but that is what's being done. Um, as a result, C-band frequencies are being repurposed for next-gen wireless devices. Primary distribution means first getting the feed, so you have to get the feed to the uplink. And anyway, the problem is that the, the 5G that is the spectrum at four gigahertz that's being used for 5G, so that's 4G being used for 5G, um, will probably cause a great deal of interference with the remaining spectrum. And how well C-band satellite will continue to work with the basically one third of the spectrum left remains to be seen. So there needs to be cost effective alternatives. Uh, yet the internet is more lossy. So what do we do? Well, we can come up with a risk satellite hybrid. So you see, here's the, the workflow we saw from the last thing where we had two data centers. Well, now we just have one data center. What if we replace one of those flows with a satellite? This way you can use the satellite uh, your, to distribute it. However, there may be hits. You may have to migrate from C-band to KU or KA band, which are both subject to rain fade. But by using RIST as, as, your, as a secondary path, that eliminates the potential interference that C-band satellite may have because if you don't receive your packet via uh, satellite, you can bring that packet in via RIST. Um, if you're using KU or KA and you have rain fade, you can also use RIST. Now the advantages are, this does give you uh, much higher reliability than just a single internet-based connection because as much as we love the internet, it, you know, it will go down from time to time, certainly from individual providers. And the same, and yet it gives you the ability to receive a signal if your internet goes down via satellite and your ability to receive a signal if your satellite goes down via internet, uh, bringing high levels of reliability to network distribution. Um, you cannot, you, we, in theory, once again, this is part of the advanced profile, so it's still under development, subject to change. Um, you can ask for the data to be sent via the internet only if you have a packet loss via satellite, or you can leave the uh, internet feed up full time. You can also be preemptive, and if your C over N or your bit error rate goes too high on the satellite, you can activate the wrist then rather than keeping it up full time. So what if I need help with wrist? Well, technical discussions take place at the wrist channel of uh, you developers on Slack, uh, www.videodev.org. There you can discuss technical questions with dozens of wrist engineers. 
Uh, you have the video services forum sites uh, where you can the site where you can download uh, TRO six dash one, the latest update dash two, and information from development pages, wrist forum for marketing stuff, and the uh, performance measurement study from NAB 2019. And there are demo clips available, including the one that I will show again in a moment, of wrist uh, demos in the cloud from past um, bid transits. So that's what I had. I'm gonna open the floor to questions while I simultaneously open the video up. The question was about LiveView, TVU, Digero, which are um, completely proprietary end-to-end -end, uh, bonding solutions for cellular. So you have to have vendor X's box on both ends, and this, this leads to the situations where most facilities have one of everything. Um, thankfully, with something like RISC, you could have um, a solution where you picked vendor A as your sender and vendor B as your receiver, um, and mix and match freely. And um, it, but that said, each vendor could still compete on the quality of their bonding solution. So that gives you both interoperability, but also freedom for the market to pick a better solution um, out there. That's almost certainly going to become more important with things like 5G. So you'll start seeing satellite-like transmissions over, over cellular. Yeah. Uh, the, the other question about address risk with TSO IP 2110-22-6. Um, well, speaking for myself, I presented about this at VidTrans, but um, I'm sure there are other options as well. Um, so I have a presentation about this topic at VidTrans uh, in February, when the world was a bit more of a normal place. But uh, there are, well, there's at least one, I'm sure, I'm sure there are other devices that can convert between RIST and 2110 and 2022-6. But RIST is generally for the compressed profile at the moment, whereas 2110, 2022-6 is uncompressed. Some people are looking towards doing the, using RIST with 2110 and 2022 over a WAN, but I don't believe that's completed yet. Rick, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, as far as the over WAN, I mean, there's another VSF group um, having to do with 21, uh, you know, 2110 over, over WAN. And, you know, they are still dealing with what the uh, protection formats are. And RIST is certainly an option. Um, as far as interoperability goes, yeah, that's, the, that's, that's what RIST is all about. Now, that having been said, as we've said, no one is forced to give up their secret sauce. If you want to have a product that has proprietary modes in, of the product uh, in it, you can do that. So we're not saying, oh, if I adopt RIST, I have to give up all the you know, things that make my product my product. Um, you can have a RIST mode, and when you are operating in RIST mode, you, you are fully risk compliant. Yet I can simply go in and click a GUI, flip a switch, and have my, I, my, I am my secret sauce mode, if you will, and operate that way. And you're no longer risk compliant. You may not be compliant with other devices, uh, but you can effect effectively as a manufacturer have the best of both worlds. I can use my own mode, or if I need to communicate with somebody who isn't my product, I go into risk mode. So I also might want to mention at this time that we are going to, or we're planning to have a presentation on the uh, WAN um, over IP group. I believe that's coming up in uh, two weeks. Uh, we'll be sending some announcements out from the, um, the VSF uh, announce list. Um, so it'll be a similar meeting to this one hour chance for uh, Andy Rayner to give a presentation and for, you know, especially an update on some of the things that, that have been happening since VidTrans and a uh, chance for folks to um, get on and ask questions. Um, so Rick, uh, Bill Magliocco um, uh, mentioned that he's really interested in the fact that um, a major U.S. television network has recently refreshed um, its satellite receivers at the affiliates. Um, and these have um, uh, Ethernet inputs as well as L-band inputs. Is, is that the right device? Is that the right kind of device to be um, working with your, your vision of the, um, mm -hmm. uh, of the future for satellite and internet merged? Yes, I mean, obviously it has to have the you know, correct on, onboard hardware, but we are looking at a, a mixed future of, satel of satellite and internet. 
whether it's using the internet to protect the satellite for whatever interference, as I mentioned, or possibly to supplement it. Um, you could easily have a situation where you have, you know, mul multiple feeds, but maybe you don't need to put all those feeds on, on the satellite. Mm -hmm. if you have a feed that's going to one or two places that could exist strictly terrestrially via wrist. And to the receiver, the end user may not necessarily know that if he dials up channel one, he's getting it from satellite. Channel two, he's getting it from satellite. Channel three, now it's coming in via wrist. And it, it could be totally, totally seamless to, to the end user who, you know, unless he looks at the diagnostics, doesn't necessarily know where that particular feed is coming from at any given moment. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So um, did you want to comment a little bit on the, um, the profiles and levels? Uh, document that's uh, being uh, that's forthcoming, Rick. Um, well, like I said, it, it's an aid document to help the users in dealing with the uh, use of the main profile. Um, we've defined certain operating points, um, and that's what's coming. It hasn't been approved yet, um, so I'm a little hesitant to go into too much detail. Well, I mean, I, I think I think what it does is it is a, it identifies a specific um, operating points that may improve uh, interoperability. Um, now, what, one of the things that I think is really important for everybody to remember is that RIST specifies the format and the um, information carried in the packets that flow between a sender and receiver. It doesn't specify how a receiver is built, how a sender is built mm -hmm. um it doesn't it doesn't go into any of the the algorithms about how you decide um uh, how to configure your buffers it doesn't cover things like um how you do compression it doesn't cover things like um you know the exact uh way that you request packets to be retransmitted and and uh, your algorithm for calculating when you do that and things like that so um in some ways, it's it's similar to what was done in some of the uh, MPEG profiles. You, know, you specify how the um, in, in MPEG you specify how the video compression is represented, but you don't specify how the video compression is done. And yeah, that was we, a go ahead. Yeah, I'll just point out one of the things that, which everybody here may know, but within RISC, we do not specify the compression. We don't you know we don't say that you're using AVC or MPEG two or whatever. Uh, we are strictly defining the transport. Um, at some point, we might, not saying we will, but might make some definitions of compression, or we may not. We may never go there. Um, we decided early on to break that off into a separate part. Whether it's something we ever get to uh, remain, remains to be seen, because uh, just on the transport side, there's so much stuff that has to be done. And uh, the compression is a whole different animal unto itself. Um, so at this time, RIST does not specify the compression format. Um, so it can be any, anything from extremely highly compressed all the way through theoretically totally uncompressed. And, and isn't it fair to say that some of the things that we're working on in, in the RISC group are um, completely content agnostic? In other words, any, anything that you have that's in the form of a of an RTP packet, you can probably get through wrist. And in fact, you, you can even move TCP flows across. Yes. Yeah, we, we, we are, we are agno agnostic, ag agnostic, sorry. Very good. Very um, good. As to that, like I said, you can move TCP flows, you can move caption data, you can move prompter data. Uh, a lot of people have been talking about moving PTZ data and CCU data. Mm -hmm. um, we move ones and zeros and we, we do it in a methodology that is video friendly. Right. And, and the nice thing about those other flows is that they, they're not baked into the same stream. In other words, we're not requiring, um, you know, and, and let, let me just explain a little bit what, what I mean in that when you're sending a, let's say a very low data rate control for, you know, pan, tilt and zoom for a camera that can be, its own individual packet stream. It can be, um, you know, just a very, you know, simple transformation from, you know, RS-232 or 422 into a 
um, a stream of packets that you're sending across the network, probably bi-directional. Um, and when you get to the far end, you don't have to go through any elaborate procedure. You know, the, the, a risk receiver can unbundle that stream and send it out on a separate IP address, separate UDP port, whatever, whatever you need in order to um, control that device. So it, we, don't, we don't require, you know, mapping these commands into a very specific protocol. Unlike some of the other things that you've seen possibly on the market where you have to deal with, you know, embedding it into an SDI or de-embedding it from an SDI, things like that. All we're doing is taking those packet streams, um, putting a compatible header on them and sending them through uh, the risk tunnel as you go through the, uh, the more advanced profiles. It's much easier for implementers and really preserves the integrity of the data from one end of the network to the other. I see that as a big advantage. Yes. All right, I'm keeping an eye on the chat window. I haven't seen any activity for a while. Um, if anybody wants to talk, um, now's a good time. Um, go ahead and unmute. You know, we'll give this I, a actually, try. Actually, I, I do see one here. Um, okay. I was just looking from... Um, Iman uh, Lolly said, uh, how, does RIST, how does RIST is used for satellite? One-way transmission that uses FEC versus RIST ARQ. That will require a two-way handshake. Um, once again, it's still in, in development, but the plan at this point is that we need to support legacy uh, MPEG transport streams. The, so there will need to at least be a mode whereby a, the satellite feed remains fully compliant with um, legacy equipment. So that does lock in how we do it. We're still developing the specifics of how we're going to do that. There've been some other folks that would like to have some more advanced uh, modulation modes that are maybe a little different. So there, there may be multiple defined modulations on the satellite side, um, but one requirement we have is that there at least be a mode that is legacy backwards compatible. Um, and as I pointed out, as I kept disclaiming in there, it's part of the advanced profile that we're working on. All of it is subject to change uh, on a daily basis, minutely basis, from the start of a meeting to the end of a meeting. Um, so I can't tell you exactly what it's going to look like when we're done. Yeah, but but back to the essential point that you were you know, just really want to emphasize, Rick, um, is yeah. that you know the, the satellite link. Yes, indeed, those are those are treated as one way um, yeah. communication links primarily. So the packet recovery mechanism would have to be um, handled on some sort of other network, um, probably the public internet. Yeah. Um, or, or a private IP data link. That, that's, uh, but there's no reason why you couldn't send the recovery packets out over the same link if you engineer things correctly, possibly. Yes. So it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, not a, it's not a trivial thing. That's why we didn't do it in the simple profile, right? <laughs> yes. And it's, it's still in development. That's right. Um, do you see any other questions, Rick? Uh, let's see. Yes. One I guess they were sent. Okay, I see one here. Any talk about needing one bit rate on one path and another bit rate on the second path? Rick, you want to take that? Um, what's one of the things that is being looked into, whether it's necessarily part of RIST or whether it's external to RIST, um, but how you would change uh, if you had, as I talked about, if you had a high data rate path, like a, a fiber or a Fios or something that you know supported a gig, and your alternate path was, say, a cable modem uh, where you were hoping to get a reliable 12 meg. Um, so you would need, we are looking in the advanced profile to put handshaking in that would allow you to um, throttle back if you had to go to your lower data rate. Uh, once again, we don't deal with the video itself. So something like, you know, similar like the HLS that can, you know, seamlessly splice between different data rates. Um, that's part of the video profile, not necessarily part of the transport profile. That's something that could be done, but it's not specifically part of RIST, which at this point is just dealing with the physical transport. Uh, well put, well put. Um, so we're, we're nearing the end of our block of time here. Um, so just wanted to uh, let everybody know, uh, the RIST activity group is um, part of the video services forum. Uh, Rick's the chair of the group. I'm the co-chair. Um, if you're interested in joining, 
um, send Rick an email. Uh, Rick, do you want to pop your uh, the the email address into the chat window real quick? Sure. Um, you know, uh, it it is a formally authorized activity group within the uh, video services forum. Uh, we meet every Wednesday. Um, you know, we're we're always you know welcoming uh, people to join. The the thing you need to be um, aware of is that if you do decide to join, there are certain rules um, of uh, engagement uh, that the Video Services Forum um, insists on for anybody participating in the um, in the group. In particular, um, you you need to be a Video Services Forum member, um, and really what that means is your your company or organization needs to be a VSF member, and then you're free to join. Um, the uh, the activity group and we'd love to have you the, the uh, you know the more people the more eyes that we have looking on the things that we're producing now uh, the more the, the better the results are likely to be in the long run so Rick I see you put your email in the chat window yep um, I think that's about it just to let everybody know we've uh, been recording this um, we'll convert this into a video we'll post it on the um, the VSF uh, YouTube channel, and I will send out a link uh, to that video uh, to everybody who has uh, registered for this meeting so um, you can see it, whether you uh, were able to attend for the full meeting in person or not. Other than that, Rick, any closing comments? That's all I have. Okay. I am talked out. <laughs> all right. Um, thanks, everybody. We appreciate your time. And um, Again, uh, two weeks from today, we'll be having a, a session on uh, the WAN um, IP um, issue, ST2110 over WAN, um, hosted by Andy Rayner. And um, uh, hopefully you'll all be able to, uh, to join in on that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.